Good morning, everyone. I hope all is well. This is Don Miller. I'm with the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery, and this is our December topical employment webinar. And the topic today is Apple for Workers with Disabilities or Healthcare for Workers with, with Disabilities. Um, we have our subject matter expert, Stephen Kozak, with us, and he will be doing the presentation today. He has a lot of good information for us. And so there will be a couple of opportunities to ask questions during the webinar. Um, I also want you to know if you have a question that has not been answered, you can email it to me. I will share it with Steve and we will compile responses and send back out to the group. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded and the recording will be sent out to uh, the registrants at a later date. Uh, having said that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Steve. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Don said, I'm Steve Kozak. I'm here at the Healthcare Authority in our Medicaid eligibility policy section. Uh, we're excited to have so many people uh, join us this morning. Uh, as you are aware, there were some significant changes made to our HWD, our Apple Health for Workers with Disabilities program. Uh, significant changes made during uh, the session earlier this year. And it looks like we've done uh, all that we need to make this happen the 1st of January. So today I realize some of you may not be that familiar with HWD, while some of you uh, may be very familiar with it. And we're just glad Don and I to be able to share with you uh, the changes that are coming very soon. We've entitled our slide to be work without fear of losing your health care. Next slide, please. And I will forewarn you, Steve, sometimes there's a bit of a delay um, in moving from one slide to the next. Oh, okay. There, I think we've got it. Yeah, that's good. Our topics are the federal authorities for HWD, our HWD program requirements here in the state of Washington, how HWD is different from other programs, uh, the disability requirements for HWD, the employment requirements for HWD, uh, HWD monthly programs, HWD and the Medicare buy-in, uh, HWD and home and community-based services, how to apply for benefits under this program, and then a list of resources that provide related information. Next slide, please. you may have been involved and remember from uh, many years ago now. Uh, we started out with HWD being implemented under the Ticket to Work and Work Incentives Improvement Act. Uh, there were several important measures in that legislation signed back in 1999. Uh, the Ticket Program uh, and then there were in under Title III of it, the demonstrations and studies. But our focus today, of course, is on the expanded health care services in Title II. Next slide, please.
it not really there we go there we go title two of uh, the ticket legislation um, there was an extension of free medicare part a premium from four to eight and a half years made medigap choice going on and off of coverage easier and then uh, our hwd program or what is Under the ticket, the upper age limit is, uh, is 64 years, which is why on the next slide, we'll talk about the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. This is the authority that we are adding this year. Uh, it came, as you can see, a couple of years before the ticket legislation when the state looked at that bill at the time, uh, it was not ready, if you will, to uh, implement a Medicaid buy-in or our HWD program. But what this bill allows is for us to provide the coverage with no age limit. As you can see there on the bullet, no upper age limit. Uh, the uh, income standard for that program at the uh, legislative level is 250% of the federal poverty level, but we uh, are in the, have worked with CMS to exclude any income above that level. So in essence, we have, that's how we get to our no income limit and then the uh, no upper age limit as well. And as far as the premiums, we'll talk about those. But for now, at least, we'll be following the same uh, calculation for premiums. Okay, to talk about the program requirements and who qualifies, first we want to say that no one needs HWD if they first qualify for one of our other programs, our Apple Health for Adults. That's the new adult program that we uh, implemented under the Affordable Care Act. Obviously, if uh, a woman is pregnant, we would want her to use that program for coverage. If someone is eligible for SSI, as you know, we have our own Medicaid program for that. And then the Medicaid protections under 1619B of the Social Security Act. These programs, you know, require no out-of-pocket costs, and that's why we would certainly want someone to use one of these programs for coverage if they're able to. In our next slide, who qualifies? Obviously, the person needs to have residence here in the state. Uh, again, no upper income limit or no test for resources. Uh, they do need to meet federal disability requirements. Either uh, they're already receiving Title II, Social Security Disability Insurance, or uh, if not, if we don't have the disability determination, we make uh, the referral for what is called the non-grant medical assistance program to uh, the Division of Disability Determination Services. And yes, someone must be employed full or part-time, including self-employment, and we'll discuss that uh, in our presentation this morning also. Once approved uh, for HMBD, uh, the person enrolling will have uh, less out-of-pocket costs since the premium cannot exceed 
seven and a half percent of total income. They'll have categorically needy or full scope of care, uh, Medicaid coverage uh, for 12 months, so long as uh, the monthly premiums uh, continue to be paid. Now our current WAC is right there, 182.511.1000. And then effective January 1st, uh, you can uh, Google the Was uh, Washington State Register with those numbers there and uh, view a tracked copy of what the rules will be effective January 1. Those don't usually get posted on the ledge website until uh, they take effect and sometimes it can take a little longer after that uh, and then we're also working to get them into the Apple Health Manual. Okay, how is HWD different from other programs? Again, no upper income limit or tax for resources. The enrollee pays a monthly premium instead of having the need spend down or participating in the, in the cost of care uh, for long-term services and supports so if, if they are receiving them also. There's a different set of rules to determine that uh, cost of care. And very often the HWD premium is going to be less uh, for them to pay. Now, of course, we have some people in an alternate living facility, uh, such as uh, an adult family home, and they do pay their monthly premium and their removal board. Removal board is not covered uh, by Medicaid. And a nice thing also about HWD that there are only designated staff who are uh, processing the applications and maintaining uh, eligibility. Okay, Don. Now, when you're helping someone with HWD, uh, it's important to help them understand that uh, there are going to be some cases like maybe they have a really small spin down uh, or for at least a first coverage if they already have incurred medical expenses to meet their spin down, they might want to exercise that option first before they start, you know, paying a monthly premium under HWD. Uh, it's important to let them know, help them understand that uh, HWD allows earnings above the substantial gainful activity level, uh, which for to, uh, the coming year, 2020, will be 1260 for a person uh, receiving benefits based on a disability or for blindness, uh, you can see there $2,110. Um, if uh, earnings though are less than SGA, or even if they are, but the Title II benefit like Social Security, Disability Insurance or DAC benefits uh, have not yet stopped, then they do have the other options uh, if they meet those requirements uh, to continue their coverage without paying the premium. But of course, in those cases, there are also resource limits that would apply for the other programs. Okay, the disability requirements for HWD. First of all, the basic coverage group is what applies to any of our SSI related programs. Uh, receiving benefits already, well then that takes care of establishing uh, that disability. Uh, or those who we refer to PDS for the non-grant 
medical assistance determination. Uh, they look at a person's medical records, and that, of course, is a good uh, option since uh, they do not have to look at how much a person may already be earning. Uh, they don't have to apply that SGA uh, test, the substantial gainful activity. Now, let me, I'll go ahead and add here. Uh, you can go ahead and click the slide, though, if you like, Don. Uh, for people who are 65 and older, if they don't have a disability uh, established yet, we'll also be referring them to DDS because the, the program does require that a person have that disability standard. And uh, as you know, a lot of our other SSI related programs uh, reaching the age of 65 automatically uh, takes care of any such requirement like that. But under the BBA, there still does have to be a, a determination of disability for someone 65 or older unless that has already been established. Now, for the second definition for the uh, medical improvement group, uh, to continue coverage under that, they do have to have been enrolled as a member of the basic coverage group. But then later, uh, you know, their health uh, status may improve, but we can continue them under that act of the Social Security Act that is listed there. Uh, if they're if they are determined by DPS to have a medical or medically improved disability, uh, they continue to have, you know, a very significant impairment, but they're, you know, able to work. Um, and basically, that definition uh, will turn on whether they continue to need services or supports to continue their, uh, their success in employment, which is much like the uh, 1619B uh, determination for people who have been receiving SSI. Okay, the employment requirements. Obviously, it's a uh, coverage for people who are working. How we define that is the person is getting paid for work activity. Uh, this is one way we define it. Uh, with earnings that are subject to federal taxes, you know, if someone's having taxes taken out of their wages, you know, it's obvious that they meet the requirement. We do acknowledge that for some employers, uh, they're prohibited uh, from taking taxes out. You know, we acknowledge that. That does not present any problem. For self-employment, um, we're going to look at some examples provided that we use that are taking, taken from the Social Security Programs Operations Manual System. But basically, we are also, we're looking at, are they maintaining business records? You know, their work activity, their expenses for that work and, and income that they're taking in as a result of that activity. They can also, of course, be filing their IRS forms for self-employment that we would ask for. Uh, the important note is that otherwise, you know, we're not looking for any minimum number of hours or amount of profit. Okay, Tom. Um, in our first example, we have Mrs. Bell uh, babysitting for her grandchild while while her daughter works. Sometimes the child comes to her home, but 
But usually this is about those to her daughter's home because of the child's toys and other items are there. Uh, Mrs. Bell is not babysitting for anyone else. Uh, she receives about $20 a week from her daughter. And although you know, caregiving is a recognized occupation, Mrs. Bell is not holding herself out uh, as a provider of daycare services. Uh, so that in this situation, she is not considered self-employed uh, for the purposes of meeting the HWD employment requirement. In this example, Mrs. Simon, uh, she's asked, asked about any income she's receiving. Uh, she is babysitting for various neighbors and friends, but does not consider herself to be self-employed. She's not filing uh, income tax on this uh, activity. She gets new business by word of mouth. So the question is, she considered self-employed? And yes, in, in our uh, a determination for HWD, just like Social Security would make the determination for the benefits she's receiving. Uh, she is considered to be self-employed and, and would meet the, the employment requirements for HWD. In example three, Mr. Lyons, he's receiving SSDI. Um, he reports that he needed extra money uh, to meet his rent and food expenses. He started collecting aluminum cans and redeems them at the recycle center. Sometimes his neighbors or local organizations call him to pick up their uh, recycling. Uh, he does not have any tax returns, but he thinks he makes about 200 a month. Uh, he is considered self-employed. It's an ongoing regular activity that includes some third-party collection pickups, and it's something he began doing with the intent of producing an income. So he does meet um, the self-employment uh, requirement for HWD. Okay, in our fourth example, Mr. Kent, he reports earning some money cutting the lawn for one of his neighbors. Uh, his car needed some repairs, and he worked out a deal um, with Mr. Kent um, so that he could cut his lawn for the month of July for $80. He would use that cash then to pay for the repair. Uh, he is not holding himself out as a lawn, uh, lawn service. So in this case, uh, it's not an ongoing regular activity. Mr. Kent doesn't plan to do this activity for a profit on an ongoing basis. Uh, so he does not meet the self-employment requirement. For the medical improvement group, there is an employment requirement called out in the legislation that a person be working at least 40 hours per month uh, and earning at least the local minimum wage. Uh, in our state for 2020, the minimum wage goes up to 13.50 an hour. Right now, we're, we're still trying to work out some flexibility that we have. So basically, we're just looking at whether the uh, person continues employment at the lo uh, level they have been 
as a member of the basic coverage group. Steve, I would say we're we're about halfway through your slide. And so I will as the slide will stop for some questions. Uh, yeah, I will we'll finish yeah. this section. A lot of employment okay. ends after someone is uh, enrolled in HWD, but they're still on their 12 month certification period. Um, if we have, you know, reasonable thought or uh, expression from the client that the job loss resulted from a health crisis or they were, you know, let go or fired, if you will, uh, so long as they're intending to return to work after their health crisis or that they continue to look for a job after having lost one and they're going to pay their premiums, uh, then we're going to keep them open through the end of their current 12 month certification. And Don, do we have some uh, questions yet that we can answer? We do have a couple of questions. Um, from Judy, we have, can you share how the HWD process and premium payment program works? Does someone apply to HWD, get approved, and then apply for premium payments? Will there be potential months that the person has to pay both okay, the HWD? Okay, here's a question. If someone is terminated for HWD for not paying their premiums, does the penalty... I'm trying to... Don, can you raise up the rest of that question, please? That bill gets cut off for us. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, Steve, there were two different questions, and I was okay. reading the first one. Can you actually hear me? Steve? Can you hear Don, me? Don, can you uh, scroll down on the question box for us, please? Okay, Steve, can you hear me? <clears throat> Sorry guys, I'm a little stepped up today. I, I hope you can hear me. <clears throat> Steve, are you able uh, to hear me? Enough. Can you hear us okay, Dawn? Can you hear me? Okay. Hang on one second. I know what happened. If you want to hang on just a second, we're having a little difficulty here, but Paige is going to fix it for us. I'm trying to get to the, you know, down here. Okay, I'm going to say so. I just got a message from from Destiny that evidently that um, you all can hear both of us, but it appears as though Steve and Paige can't hear me. I can hear them. This is Dawn, and so um, I apologize for the you difficulties. Seem to be here on our end. So hang on one second. Okay, I'm going to try to get on our end. If for some reason your question doesn't get answered, I will definitely make sure that it shows up in an email to Steve so that it's answered and, and you get a response from him. I'm trying to get to our volume. 
remember I shut the little volume thing off so the emails wouldn't keep dinging in. And now I can't get back to it. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue to do the slideshow and we will just have to take questions at the end through email. Does that sound okay? Let's just keep going. Don, can you hear me? If you can, would you go to the next slide, please? Okay, we'll we'll try to do our questions again after we finish. Um, okay, how much are the monthly premiums? Uh, we do two calculations. Uh, ACES does this automatically for us. Uh, that first uh, list of steps taken, that was first defined by the legislature when HWD was first uh, implemented. And then it looks at a total of 7.5% of all income and takes the uh, amount that is less um, and the other for the monthly premium amount. Next slide, please. Uh, we count only the income of the individual, uh, so that if there are two spouses applying, each would have their own premium based on their own income. Uh, we do have to use taxes, I mean, income before taxes, but there are certain federal uh, exclusions that are uh, allowed under uh, statute other than the Social Security Act. And we do not apply the SSI rules of deducting 65 and a half from earnings before we use the premium uh, calculations that uh, we just described. Uh, next slide, please. In the uh, first step, if yeah, a person has unearned income, say their Social Security uh, disability uh, income of $983, then their earnings are $1,065. So we go through that calculation, add those things up, and the premium at that step would be $174 a month. The next slide, though, uh, you can see that we'll uh, take the seven and a half, seven and a half percent of total income. In the next slide, and that amount then comes down to one hundred and fifty-three dollars. So that lower amount would then be the premium. Next slide. The 
although <laughs> when you compare that with the spin down amount using those same amounts of income, and this is just a three month spin down amount, you can see at $2,040, uh, the monthly premium is a much better deal. Next slide, please. Now, using those two income amounts that we had from before, we just want to show the comparison here that if you were add those two together for the same amount of income, but it would be all earned income instead of a mix of the Social Security and earnings. So you can see that the premium calculation uh, brings that monthly premium down to $49 uh, per month. Next slide, please. How are the premiums billed and paid? Uh, the Office of Financial uh, Recovery, we contract with them. Uh, they also do the billing for the CHIP program. But for HWD also, they send the invoice uh, during the first week of the month uh, following the month of coverage. Uh, and they have a person pays their premium, sends them to OFR. Uh, they are provided a return envelope to send that payment in. And then we say here, OFR notifies HWD staff that the premium pays, payment falls for less behind. And, you know, that's actually done, if you will, through our systems. It, it, it generates an alert to uh, the staff when premiums are falling that far behind. Now, as you notice here, they're billed the first week following the month that uh, coverage has been provided. This is for regular ongoing coverage. But for the retro coverage, if someone wants up to three months of coverage before the month of application that they submitted, then the premiums for the retro coverage do have to be paid in advance before we can uh, authorize coverage for those months. Um, people, of course, can use the mail-in option, but for those who would prefer, there's also an online payment option, uh, which they can set up by going to that link provided there and, and setting up a user account. Next one, uh, slide, please. Okay, this slide, I believe, sort of gets at the question that we were trying to um, view all of the question. We can only see part of it, but uh, this might get at part of the uh, answer to that question. If a person does fall four months behind, we send them an advance notice that we're closing their benefits. And once that happens, the person is closed for non-payment, then they cannot be eligible for four months during what we call the sanction period. And to become eligible again, they would uh, need to wait those four months and pay the premiums they owe in full. Next slide, please. Okay, as we know, there's a monthly premium cost for buying into Medicare. HWD can help with that while the person pays their premium. Uh, the state is going to pick up their uh, premium for Part D coverage um, through the Medicare Savings Program if they meet the requirements for what we call the QMD program or the SLIMBY program, which the meetings are spelled out there on the slide. But then there are also some people in HWD who have higher income that you know are above the Quimby and SLIMBY limits. Then we have our state-funded Medicare buy-in. 
that is a part of our agreement that's required by Social Security that we cannot begin payment of their Part D premium if they're in the state funded group until the third month of eligibility for their Apple Health. That premium for January 2020 will be at $144.60. Uh, next slide, please. HWD and home and community-based services. HWD is an eligibility group for our uh, waiver services. Uh, working clients with disabilities who have income that are greater than the special income level or the cell, if you will, that applies to people um, that participate in the cost of care according to formulas for those programs. Uh, and that amount is for January 2020, it'll be $2,349. So if people are earning a bad amount and need waiver services, they can use HWD and pay the monthly premium and continue to receive those uh, waiver services. So again, as we mentioned before, someone in an alternate living facility, instead of paying the cost of care under the institutional rules, they instead would only pay their room and board and the HWD premium. Okay, how to apply. Uh, the Washington Connection website. Uh, if a person can apply, on, uh, apply online, that's probably easier these days. But they can also mail an application uh, to this uh, address what we think of as the ALSA hub or the imaging center. They can also fax an application to that number or they can call the HW line to request an application be sent to them. Uh, as stated before, um, there's always a designated staff person working with HWD. Uh, for most people, there's a couple of staff in the GDA specialty unit that handles their HWD application and maintaining their uh, main, yeah, maintaining their eligibility. But if a person is also receiving home and community services, um, then they'll have a designated staff person uh, in the region uh, they live in. Uh, next slide, please. For resources, we have information in our Apple Health Manual, uh, both in the regular Medicaid section, if you will, and then uh, Home and Community Services uh, maintains a very good informational page in the long-term uh, care or long-term services and support section of the manual to working clients on long-term care programs. Now for a link to the overall HCA eligibility manual, there's one a link provided there and then these uh, CAW HW fact, uh, fact sheet, which has been updated and is available uh, at that link. So the information again for January is contained in that uh, new fact sheet. Uh, next slide, please. And then if you're not familiar with our Pathways to Employment web portal, I encourage you to use the link at the bottom of the slide to access it, to look through the uh, information 
resources there also has a benefits estimator that helps people understand how their cash benefits uh, would be uh, affected by uh, earnings that they would have through employment. In essence, it's a set of tools that we hope to help individuals with blind disorders ability to make informed decisions about going to work. It's designed to help people better understand their benefits, reduce their fear of working and you know, losing their health care coverage. The website helps uh, to show them that they are not going to lose their health care because of their earnings. Hopefully to help them increase their independence through higher earnings and savings and make uh, better plans for a more uh, successful uh, future. We will try to get our volume fixed on this issue on this end. Um, let's just take like one or two seconds here so I can try to get that figured out. And if not, it might be done that we ask you to read us what the questions are. If you can do that from. We can't hear them though. We can't hear what they're saying. They can hear us, but we can't hear them. Oh, okay. Sorry. Steve, so can you guys hear me? To help me? Could, could, uh, can you guys hear me now? This is Dawn. Steve. It won't even let me do that. It's, it won't let me. I think we're going to just have to take questions by email to Don for you. And I didn't want to do that, but I can't. For some. Like it's frozen on our end for some reason. Can we just sign up and come back in? We could try that. Okay, Don, we're going to sign out and then come back in and see if we can then uh, hear you. Uh, or maybe just have you read to us what the questions are. So we're gonna we're gonna try to do that now. Okay, it, it appears as though the rest of the group can hear me talking. I really apologize. I've, I've never experienced this before where it wasn't possible for one organizer to hear the others talking. And so um, I apologize for the technical difficulties. It sounds like um, Steve and uh, Paige are gonna try and sign out and sign back in and hopefully that will resolve the issues. Uh, if it does not, I will assure you that I've, I've got a list of all the questions um, and we'll make certain that all of the questions get answered by email. Um, if someone would also just type me a response in the, the question box and let me know that you heard what I had to say now, that would be helpful too. The last one, where do we email our questions to? And thank you, Don. Thanks for, for letting me, me know that it's working. Uh, my email address is dawn, D-A-W-N, dot Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R, at H-C-A, dot wa, dot gov. I can also type that into the, I'll go ahead and put it in the, the chat box so that, um, that you can see it there too. Um, one of the things to know, a couple of people have asked, are you going to get slides and let, yes, you will. I will send out PowerPoint. Um, I will also send out a recording to the webinar um, so that you can listen to it again at your leisure. We are working on, we have a wiki, yeah, for those of you that know about our wiki, and we're going to be posting uh, PowerPoints for the, the whole year for all the different webinars on the wiki, um, as well as we have uh, four benefits planning webinars that were done by WISE for two hour webinars, and the links to the webinars will be on the wiki as well. So a lot of good information. 
Can there you hear us now? There, I think I hear Steve back on again. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, we can now, but we have not been able to prior to just now. I, it was very frustrating. I know the audience was hearing all of us. <laughs> it was kind of, I've never, never seen that happen before. That was very, very odd. Um, I was just talking to them about the fact that we're going to send out the PowerPoint uh, and the recording, and we're going to be posting various things on the wiki. When I send out the thank you for attending uh, email to the registrants, the, the wiki web address will be in that. All right. Do you so would you like me to go back and, and verbally read some of the questions to you so that you can answer uh, them as we go? Yeah, please. Okay. All right. I'm going back to the, there are actually a lot of questions. So I'm going back to, to find the first okay. one. Um, Judy said, can you share how the HW process and premium payments program works? Does someone apply to HWD, get approved, then apply for premium payments? Will it be potential months that the person has to pay both the HWD and the other insurance premium? Are we talking about uh, Medicare or another insurance? But let me just try to answer both. Um, Sounds good. If someone has another insurance type, like say through their employer, uh, the healthcare authority can look at whether or not it would be cost effective for the agency to reimburse the person uh, for, you know, on a monthly basis, their payment of that premium. Uh, for Medicare uh, coverage, you know, which we covered, and I'm not sure if the question came in before then or not, but uh, the agency will pick up payment of the Medicare premium. Um, but for you know, people in the state funded coverage and, and even the uh, other Medicare coverage, it'll take a couple of months for Social Security to stop take uh, the premium out of their check. But for those who are having their premium uh, taken out of their check and then a couple of months later they start, they start picking it up, those people will get reimbursement of what they pay you. Hopefully that answers the question. I, I will say too, Steve, that some of the questions I'm going to answer or ask, <clears throat> excuse me, that I'm going to read <laughs> were posted pretty early and so they may have been answered during the slides. I'm going to read them out of respect for the people that asked the questions. So in case there's some piece that wasn't answered, yeah. Um, so Crystal had asked, if someone's terminated from HWD for not paying their premiums, does the penalty period begin once they've paid the back payments for the premiums or upon termination? Uh, it starts the, the month after they were terminated. So the four months, four months just automatically kick in after they've been closed for non-payment. Uh, Christina asks, if you lose your job, does your premium amount get reduced or reevaluated, do you need to report the job loss? Uh, absolutely, yeah. We, we need to know when there's an income change. And so when your income goes down from, from having lost your job, yes, then that's, that enables us to then reduce, recalculate the premium and reduce it. Tom asks, can you enroll before getting employed? I have a client that had to quit his job because his, his DAC benefit and, and parents' military benefits put him right at the income limits. So can someone join HWD before getting a job? Oh, they have to be working um, before we can approve an application. They have to be working at the time. And of course now the, the income limit won't be a problem. Um, Amanda asks, can a person qualify for HWD if they have a disability 
that wouldn't allow them to work if they didn't receive treatments. With treatments, the person is able to work with accommodations. Uh, and uh, once they're first applying, they they have to meet the full you know disability requirement and be working. But yes, later on, after they've been enrolled, if their health situation improves, but uh, they still meet that you know second level of disability, if you will, that's based in part on whether the person continues to need that treatment. Uh, and or medications to continue employment, then yes, that, that allows us to continue their coverage on that second group. Uh, Kathy asks, if a person is self-employed and their income is inconsistent, is the premium based on the amount earned at certification? Are they certified for the 12 months? Well, at first, you know, we, we need to make a reasonable determination. Uh, if absolutely necessary, if there's a lot of fluctuation, we can look at trying to average what the uh, payment might be. But, you know, on the other hand, we could establish an initial premium and they could notify us. And we could adjust it, you know, as the months go by. But you know, just to make it a little less cumbersome for, you know, reporting every month and staff having to change it every month, we do make a reasonable effort to come up with a, uh, an average that both sides, if you will, uh, the agency and the client could uh, uh, agree to as reasonable. Uh, Alana asked, is there an automated payment option for individuals with memory or other cognitive concerns? Is there an automated payment option for individuals? Oh, it actually just repeated itself twice. Sorry about that. So automated payment option for individuals with memory concerns. Uh, yes, using that uh, web link that we provided for doing a, a payment online, if you will, you can set up an account and have your bank hooked in for uh, automated uh, payment. I, you know, for people who really need that, it's a good thing. I, I do want to share with people that sometimes they get that set up and then their income changes, and you know, there there are some uh, some time lag, if you will, between the bank and that that service to to get the amounts changed. You have to look at what day of the month the premium is going to be paid and what have you. But otherwise, yes, it's there available. And um, we would you know, certainly want people to take advantage of that. Uh, Tom well, asks, what my resources? Does this include earned and unearned in income? Excuse me. Can they have resources such as a car, uh, et cetera? Uh, absolutely, Grace. If we do, there's, we don't even have to look at resources like uh, automobiles or bank accounts or, or what have you. Excellent. Uh, Robin asks if an individual chooses HWD, can they opt out or change options later? Uh, yes, they can change. They can ask to uh, have the HWD benefit terminated at any time. Okay. Um, Destiny asked if someone is, if someone is ended for non-payment, just to clarify, the four-month clock to reapply starts after they've paid off the unpaid premiums. Uh, no, not necessarily. The, the four months begins right, you know, the first month following. So, you know, they aren't able to pay back the premiums until a few months later that that four month clock would have already started. Okay. Uh, Carrie asks, if a person is receiving benefits from their employer, do they have to, to get up to receive benefits from HWD? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? 
Absolutely. Um, if a person is receiving benefits from their employer, do they have to give it up to receive benefits from HWD? Um, oh, I'm assuming that means if they have employer-sponsored insurance. Yeah, not at all. You know, sometimes people do have uh, employer-sponsored insurance, and you know, they wouldn't even necessarily have to, you know, be having to pay for those. But HWD will always provide sort of a wraparound service, as we uh, describe it, uh, especially for someone that might need, you know, personal care or what have you that's not normally covered under uh, employer insurance. And the HWD would provide, uh, you know, payment for those services as a wraparound service. Okay, uh, Christina. Yeah. I, it says, I thought the threshold was removed from HWD for DD waiver services. Is that correct? Uh, yes, the, the income is, is uh, no longer required for HWD, and that and HWD would still provide access to uh, the waiver. So long as they you know, meet the assessment requirements and are approved for services. Uh, the Laura says, can you please clarify somebody who was determined medically recovered by SSA and are they working, can they get HWD? Um, uh, if you need me to read that. It's about the medical improvement. Yeah, no, those are, uh, the person would still need, you know, to have a very significant disability that needs services and treatment to continue. But I, you know, I, I can't provide any detail beyond that. You know, that's a DDS uh, policy and procedure, you know, that I'm not familiar with all those details. But they first have to meet the full disability requirement uh, and then have that uh, change or improvement. Uh, later, they can't come in under the, you know, group group, if you will. Uh, Laura also asked, can you please clarify the interaction between premium uh, HI and HWD? Uh, I think we've covered that. Okay. okay. That's the Judy asks, could you please read my question about premium payments in HWD? And I think that was, was much earlier, so we've done that. Um, let's see here. Um, is there one review per 12 month period, even if the client's income goes up and down? An eligibility review, yes, is required every 12 months. And so then even if the income goes up and down, that is just the 12 months. Uh, 12 months, yeah, that we do have to complete a review, no matter okay. the changes that might be in income. Okay. Uh, Christina asked, if someone loses their job and no longer qualifies for HWD and they have a retirement slash pension plan through their employer, do they have to get rid of their pension uh, benefit in order to qualify for Social Security programs? Are there resources to help individuals navigate this change? Okay, let me first bring up the fact that I don't think our last slide got added to this presentation, Don about the new resource account exclusion. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead and talk to that uh, real quickly. After, okay. someone, after someone enrolls in HWD, the earnings they make from their job or their self-employment, uh, they can uh, begin to deposit that in a separate account one that's designated by the client as 
you know, it's going to be their savings, or some people might refer to it as their independence account. It's a separate account that has no other funds in it. They can put some of the money they earn after they enroll into that savings account, and then we'll, you know, need to document that, if you will, in the case narrative, so that later if they have to apply for a different Medicaid program after, you know, they might leave HWD, then the uh, money in that account can be excluded or not be counted, if you will, when determining eligibility for another Medicaid program that would, that, you know, does have or Resource. Okay, I'm not a you know, social security employee or expert, but for SSI, you know, there is a resource limit, but for other social security, the Title II benefits, you know, the SSDI, the DAP benefit, uh, or the uh, DWB benefit, the disabled widow or widow or benefit, uh, there is no resource tax. Now we might get some questions on that resource uh, exclusion doc. Okay. Um, and I can certainly, the, the slides that I pulled up are the ones that you emailed to me this morning. So we may need to double check to, to see, um, you know, kind of where that slide migrated to <laughs> before oh, I send okay. it out to the. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, let's, yeah, let's do that before you send it out. Ahmed said, uh, he says, you emailed questions to me and will you be going through those? Uh, Tom, I think uh, because to get to my email right now would be to take my slideshow and things that we'll answer those via the, the thank you for attending email and compile the answers there and send out. Um, if you want to ask an additional question, go ahead and type it in the box and we'll continue going through the ones that I that I see in the question box this morning. Um, Connie says the income slash employer change needs to be reported even though the review is not due. And so it's evidently just a comment and not a question. Um, well, no, that's a good point. I appreciate her saying that because, you know, we, we are, you know, uh, part of the requirements of being having Medicaid is to report changes to us that include mm -hmm. income. But I, I, I think at the point, at the time we were making the point that yeah, we, we can only make a change in the premium if, you know, if the person lets us know there's a change in the income. In other words, we don't have any automatic uh, database check that's going on behind the scenes that would let us know what the changes are. So, yeah, the person is supposed to, but yeah, if they want us to change anything, then obviously they, they need to let us know. Mm -hmm. And there are other systems that require that support various things at any rate. So all the systems dovetail. Uh, Alana says, can you please explain more about what the cost to the individual would be for someone working and living in an adult family home? Um, you say they pay HW plus room and board, but what, what are we looking at for our out of pocket costs? Well, the room and board is going to be, uh, the amount of the current amount of the SSI cash benefit minus uh, their personal needs allowance, which would be $70. So the SSI effective January is $783. Their personal needs allowance would be $70. So that's $713 for their room and board. And then whatever their HWD premium will be based on the two different uh, calculations that we looked at. Uh, 
Jan asks, can HWD pay the premium for an employer's health care plan? If, uh, yeah, it would be, the information would need to be sent in uh, to the staff and then they would send it in to our uh, coordination of benefit staff here at the health care authority. And they would do an assessment as to whether or not it's cost effective for us to reimburse the uh, person the, the amount of out of cost they have for that uh, insurance coverage. Uh, Tom asks, uh, Steve stated that you have to be working before joining. What happens to someone that exceeds the income limit under traditional rules before joining HWD? Is there a grace period? Can someone join HWD once they have a proposed start date for employment? Uh, no, they have to be employed for us to be able to mm -hmm. approve it. Okay. And that's actually all the questions that we have in the list at the moment. Um, certainly we still have time to address questions. Uh, and so if you have additional questions, please feel free to type them in. Um, hopefully we've answered the, the questions that people have had. Um, if you need some clarification, do please also type that in. Um, and then as, as you know, we've mentioned here a couple of times, any questions that did not get answered, if you want to send them to me, I can forward them to Steve and we'll compile um, an email with the answers in it and send it out to the group that registered. Um, I just, I have to say, I really appreciate everybody's patience today. It looks like most of you with us, even through the, the, <laughs> the technical difficulties, thank you for your patience in, in regards to that. That was very, very unusual, new thing that I wouldn't have assumed could have happened. <laughs> Murphy's Law or something, I don't know. Um, no, and Steve, I, have, I, have, I appreciate the fact that, that you logged out and logged back in again and resolved our issue. So thank you for your quick thinking in regards to that. But you were able to see the rest of the slides as we went through them? Yes. So, okay. And we, uh, we've now been able to list of questions as well quite a list of questions and very very good ones so thank you those of you that asked the questions for doing that um I'm sure thank, you. thank uh, you to presenters and all go ahead steve i'm sorry oh no i'm sorry i didn't i wasn't sure if you were hearing me uh you might share with them too that say maybe six months or so you know depending upon other topics you have in your monthly uh, webinars, uh, like, for instance, the concept of having this uh, extra resource uh, exclusion, this account, you know, this is really a new thing. I think mean, one other state only has it. And I think ours is going to be a little less restrictive than that. So we're really going to have to see how it works out. And, you know, come up with some appropriate rules and get uh, input from people. So, because I know mean, it's, there's not really an example that we can you know, look to for all the details. So, we'll be working on that together with people. And, um, you know, the other changes as well, what that's going to be for people in the program. So, later, you know, if you would like us to do this sort of an update uh, or Part two, Don, you know, we're, we're certainly willing to try to plan for that, you know, later uh, into the coming year. I think that's I a think marvelous that's idea, idea. idea for, for you to do a presentation. All right. Um, so, uh, Nina said thank you. Uh, Appreciate the feedback, Arlene. You're you're most welcome. Um, Natalie as well uh, said this is very good information, Steve, and this was helpful. I think so too. I uh, uh, I've been with HWD for quite a long while, but not all the nuances. And I think Steve did a great job of sharing a lot of information today. 
Well, it was my pleasure and I thank everyone for participating. And, and please, if I didn't answer your question fully, please let Dawn know. Uh, she's going to send us those and we'll, we'll do our best to provide you, you know, with a better or more clear statement uh, on the uh, answers to your questions. Okay. So my feeling is that as long as there are no other questions, we would go ahead and end a little early. It never hurts to have a, you know, a little bit of time back in your day <laughs> if you're like me. <laughs> Thank you so much for attending. I will send out that email with PowerPoint recording uh, question answers. Uh, it'll have the wiki address and it'll have the pathways to employment address. Um, uh, if there is anything else at that point in time that people feel that they should have gotten that they did not, please let me know and I'll send that out as well. Thank you again so very much, Steve, and to all of you for your patience. Uh, happy holidays. I hope everyone has has uh, wonderful holidays, and we'll look forward to seeing you again at our webinar in January. Thanks so much. Thank you.